enjoying it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a seemingly tangential episode six of Disney Real to Real, a deep, deep, deep delve into the Disney animated canon. Uh, this month, I kind of wanted to fudge up the timeline a little bit because I had a very special opportunity that I could not pass up. Uh, so joining me today to discuss 1948's The Pirate from Metro Goldwyn Mayer is writer, biographer, and wife of MGM musical extraordinaire Jean Kelly, Miss Patricia Ward Kelly. Welcome to Disney Real to Real. Thank you very much. It's, I'm delighted and delighted to have received the invitation from you this will be fun yes yes i hope so too um so going into each episode i typically ask my guests um what prior associations they have with various um, films or media but you you seem to have a very special connection right off the bat so i figure the best way to kick things off would be to ask how you and Jean first met well, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's a little hard to believe, actually. Some people think I'm making it up. I'm not making it up. But I was a writer on a television special about the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., and Jean was the host narrator. And the grand irony is that I did not know who Jean Kelly was at the time. I was a very nerdy Herman Melville scholar and uh, completely intent on going, uh, I had been in graduate school at the University of Virginia and was intent on uh, finishing my PhD and going to teach in some uh, university and, and continuing to work. I was editing Melville's works in an authoritative text and I loved the work. I loved the very detailed, precise uh, primary source investigation and uh, so I got this job and I was sort of thrown in this room with Gene because uh, to keep other all the other women away from him because he was the most eligible bachelor in the world at the time. And so uh, it, it turned out that my pet study studies in graduate school were word origins. It was etymology and poetry and those just happened to be Gene's pet studies as well. And so we started playing word games and quoting poetry back and forth. And I, I was just, by the middle of the week, I was enchanted. And he spoke multiple languages. He read Latin. He um, very often read a book a day. He was just this tremendously erudite gentleman, but without putting on airs about it. There was a kind of ease about his knowledge and his language and, and a delight. I mean, it was a real curiosity and delight in in learning things and in words and i just found it i was just i was just completely uh taken in but still didn't know even by the end of the week i didn't know he was famous and and tell somebody told me after he had driven off that told me he was quite famous and i could go down to the video store and ask for gene kelly which i did and and then I realized that there were about 48 movies that I had missed in my lifetime. I just didn't, I didn't grow up in a, I, I often hear from people now that maybe they lived in New York or even Los Angeles. So they would go to the movies all the time, even Pittsburgh where Jean, Jean grew up going to the movies and, but I didn't. And I, 
I hear from people now, they'll say, oh, my mother used to keep me home from school so that we could watch the movies in the afternoon. Well, that was not my mother. So, so I really just didn't have the, I was, I, I was more in a library with my nose in a book than I was in the movies. And so, uh, but I, I think in retrospect, it was really the get the way to get to know Gene because instead of coming with some kind of preconceived notion of who he was, I, he was essentially a blank slate to me. And so I had to really listen to him and uh, start to interview him. He, he brought me out after we worked together, he brought me out to California and then asked me if I would stay and write his memoir with him. And I said, yes. And so I ended up recording him in some fashion uh, nearly every day for over 10 years. And, and that's, I'm still finishing. I hope to actually finish that book next year. But in the meantime, I created a one woman show about him that's been touring for 10 years. And I created a big live symphony tribute to him. And I just wrote an eight part radio series about him for uh, France Musique in Paris. And uh, we remounted his ballet from 1960 with Scottish ballet. And uh, that is called Starstruck now, and that will start to tour. And so just a lot of different things have come out um, as a result of this funny meeting that, you know, I, I, I hear from people that they, they want to come to California and meet a f- famous person and they dream about marrying a, famous man or woman or something. And that was certainly never on my agenda. So it was, in in many ways, I think people assumed it was a relationship that wouldn't really work, but in fact, it worked quite well. And I think it, I think Jean knew that, um, that by entrusting me with his legacy and with his archives and things that I would carry on the 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 word the way that he wished to be remembered which was particularly for being behind the camera as a director and choreographer and for creating this uh particularly american style of dance yes and i must say that i've heard you tell this story on numerous occasions and i never get tired of it (laughs) because it's just such a genuine romantic situation and i just find it so endearing it's it is funny though i mean i i laugh when people say oh she's just making that up it couldn't it'd be possible how could you not know <laughs> when i just laugh because i think no i had no clue i mean i remember i remember walking around alexandria downtown alexandria virginia with the producer and the and they're talking about this thing called sing in the rain that's to die for. And I have no idea what they're talking about, but I wasn't about to show my ignorance. So I just played along with it, but I, I did not know it. I, I mean, it really is in looking back, you know, it's, it was a large part of the 20th century that, that I missed out on, but, uh, but it is true. And I, I do, I still walk around. I walk, I go back to Beverly Hills occasionally and I just, I'm like, I can't believe that this life that I just tumbled into and Roddy McDowell uh, really took me under his wing after Gene died. And he said to me, he said, Oh my dear. He said, you're like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. And I think that's the way I felt. It was kind of like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <You know? Yes. laughs> well, um, I suppose prior to um, inviting you for this discussion on 1948's The Pirate, um, I had forgotten that Gene actually has two Disney connections, um, one of which is very innovative and creative. The other is kind of insulting and perpetuating of myths that you have been working to dispel. Uh, So let's start with a negative one first. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Um, so in 1989, the Walt Disney World Resort opened this theme park called Disney MGM Studios. And they have this replica of the Grauman's Chinese Theater at the hub of the park. 
And they had this attraction called the Great Movie Ride that went on for quite some time. And it featured a tableau of your husband as Don Lockwood in Singing in the Rain. And what is that lovely myth that people love to perpetuate? Oh, it's got to be the putting milk in the water so that you could see the raindrops, if I had to guess. I, I would think that might be one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, and it really, I, I, I find it's, I don't know where that one got started because it's uh, even, I mean, Gene sh- tried to shut that down in his lifetime and, and Stanley Donnan did and just said, oh, that's just absolutely not true. So I don't know how that just got traction. And the thing is, it's just, it really is, uh, it was just extraordinary cinematography and lighting uh, that, that how you backlight that rain, because it, it was very, very difficult when Gene is dancing in front of the plate glass windows. And how do you, how do you shoot that? How do you backlight the rain without the equipment showing up in the glass in the, and in fact, several of the takes ha- had had to be redone because uh, the the it was reflected in the in the glass. Um, you could see the equipment. So I, when I read the notes at the Arthur Freed Collection at USC, I could see several that that had to be redone because of that. But I mean, it was really a phenomenal cinematography and lighting that that accomplished that. And you, you don't put milk in the water to see the raindrops but it i can't i boy you know i've been trying to stomp that out for so long and it it just persists i think i've i may have gained a little ground but it still pops up (laughs) sadly Mm -hmm. yes uh there may not be milk in the raindrops but you can definitely cause a water shortage in culver city that's (laughs) correct That did, that did, um, that did happen. They had to, well, it was, it was that the water uh, pressure went down uh, when everybody came home from work uh, and either took showers or watered their lawns. And so they had to stop shooting that day and then hang extra rigging so that they had enough water pressure to, for the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, But then in the other direction, um, Gene at one point actually wanted to work on this hybrid live action animation sequence in Anchors Away. And because MGM had not experimented with any hybrid photography at the time, um, he was advised to meet with Walt Disney to do one of two things. I haven't been able to pinpoint which one. He either wanted to license the use of his character Mickey Mouse for the sequence Or he simply wanted to get advice on using live action animation technology to better suit the sequence. Well, and the story in this one is there's a lot of mythology about this because you hear things that he he did um, when he went to the heads of the studios studio at MGM. They didn't really even think it could be done, but they said um, that they would make an, they made a call over to Walt Disney uh, to see if Gene could go over and meet with him and which he did. And uh, you'll hear the story of the lie that, that Walt Disney said, absolutely not. You know, you'll never get Mickey Mouse and things like that. And in fact, he, he just said, I, I think it's a terrific idea to blend uh, live action and animation. Disney had been experimenting with it, but in a very primitive way, nothing with the kind of movement that you got with Gene dancing. So he thought he was very intrigued by it. And, and but he was so consumed at that time by the, the work that he had for the war effort that he couldn't uh, pull off and devote the time necessary to do a number like it. But he agreed that he would call the studio MGM back and he would say, he would give, say that they should give the green light to it. And so it was really to uh, Walt Disney's credit that the number got made because then, then uh, it came back to MGM and you had, Hanna-Barbera under that 
um, heading. And so, so instead of Mickey Mouse, you get uh, Jerry the Mouse. And but it was really Disney's support that helped get allow Gene to get that off the ground. Um, and that that's the true story. So. Um, it, and it's a phenomenal piece. I mean, when you look at it and again, people th- kind of take it for granted. Now they take, I think they take all of Jean's, a lot of Jean's innovations for granted because now with a computer, you could do it so easily. I mean, you have c- computer technology, but when you think about the fact that each of those, each mouse is drawn in each second is a mouse that's an individual cell so in that sequence you have over 3,000 individual drawings of Jerry and if you watch closely it's different people drawing Jerry so sometimes he's a little fatter and sometimes he's a little taller and so sometimes he has a little different spin but uh, it it's even or Gene in the 1944 with Cover Girl when he danced with himself in the alter ego number that she had it was the first time ever to dolly and pan in double exposure in Technicolor again they said it couldn't be done the director Charles Vidor shut down the set said impossible I'm leaving uh, it was the the head of the studio who gave Gene the light green light to go ahead with that but now if Gene wanted to do it he would just it, you just do it on a computer you do it once and then do it twice so uh, I think uh, it's so radical uh, to what he did with the mouse and 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 still still primitive but but way ahead of its time um, he he kind of laughed when Roger Rabbit came out and. He, he opened the Los Angeles Times newspaper and it said that it was the first time ever that that anyone had combined live action and animation. And Gene just kind of thought, well, I think somebody else worked on that a little bit before. But <laughs> Well, um, I guess getting into the pirate itself, um, I believe that you might have been introduced to that while during research with Gene for his memoir. Is that correct? Yes, I made him watch all of his movies. He didn't like to watch his movies, but I forced him to do it because uh, f- because of our work. And I just kept a tape recorder running, uh, and he would comment. And um, and the the funny thing about the pirate is how um, well I always say people run hot or cold about it. The either people are very passionate about it, they love it, or they don't like it at all. So I always say that Liza Minnelli and I are in the passionate, we love it category because I, I, I love the movie. I just think it's, I think it's beautiful. The, the color, the, the lush technicolor, the, the music, uh, Cole Porter in this cut, his witty, uh, his witty lyrics and the playfulness of Gene and, uh, the kind of, you know, I see his funny little faces and little nods of his head. And and then I really think the chemistry between Gene and Judy is so palpable and they're, they're just so beautiful together. And, and I really, I, I, I could watch it again and again. And I think it gets kind of trounced by the critics, the critics uh, and the quote biographers who uh write about it, dismiss it in many ways. And it was not dismissed at the time. I mean, Gene got very high marks, as did several of the performers in it. So it's, it's, it got kind of short shrift in, and, and it didn't deserve that. I went back and read the reviews and, and um, I think it was, I, 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 I really, I think it should rise in its, um, I, I wish it were screened more often. I, w- I would love to see it on the big screen again. Oh, yes. Especially since they did that whole um, restoration recently. Yeah, I think I, I just, they often show Singing in the Rain. And I just think that, that I'd love to show more. And I think The Pirate is definitely one. I also think Summerstock. You know, it's goofy and 
silly in some ways, but there's some beautiful numbers in it. And but the pirate has a quality that I think is, um, I I just I love the, I I love Gene's kind of. <laughs> It just makes me laugh when I see him. He's got this, even when he jumps up, uh, leaps up, he does his outrageous dance with uh, around the pole and everything. And then he runs up and, and he's up looking at the poster of himself and he's got this yeah. little quirky little, <laughs> I mean, he's just, it's so, it's so hokey, but it's so wonderful. And and then the sword, the dance with the sword, um, when he's in the black shorts and the music accompanying that. And um, but the I just think the wit and charm when they're fighting with each other and and the it it's I I just think it I think and I was very happy when I started posting about it on social media that that other people love it too. I think. I think people love it. I think audiences love it. I think that it's the quote critics that have dismissed it. It's not people. Oh no. I've certainly never met those people. <laughs> well, just don't read any books. Just stay away from books. <laughs> it just gets a bad rap and it's you know, some people called it the musical of the year. It was Gene had a 92% approval rating. Um it was, um, I think what they did is they f tend to focus on the loss of money that because it did go over, uh, because there were many days when Judy Garland did not show up or she showed up late. So, so in some ways it went over budget. And I think that becomes the, the focus is, oh, it lost so much money, but in fact it was quite popular. So um, so I like to bring it back up and the, the Gene said that the, his character was the, the, the kind of in joke with Vincent Minnelli, uh, between Vincent Minnelli and Gene was that, that Gene would play this kind of mix of John Barrymore and Douglas Fairbanks senior. And, and, and they both thought that that would be so obvious to everybody that this was their, that he's playing on this char these characters and and i guess some people didn't understand that and they thought maybe he was overplaying and everything but in fact he's just it's just a nod to these heroes of his and everything and the and that kind of swashbuckling charm and the pirate charm and everything so <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, refer back to the pirate ballet sequence in just a few moments because I have some thoughts. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, I think the pirate, I, I've, I've evaluated the same way as you do, but I sense this sort of disconnect between the first and the second and third act in the sense that like it's very straightforward in the beginning. You have this sense of who all the characters are from a distance but then as soon as you get to the moment where Seraphin comes to retrieve Manuela and then he runs into Don Pedro and he's like, oh, you are Mac the Black Makoko. And then it suddenly becomes even more farcical. Then it sort of has a massive tone shift that I can kind of understand why that makes people turn one way on it or the other. But I like it. Yeah, I mean, I I guess you've dissected it more. I I I just kind of went with the flow of it more. Than, <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I you've you've broken it down, and I just kind of go with the. I I just, I mean, even he even has the 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 Douglas Fairbanks the cigarette trick with the from the gaucho. I mean, so he's he's incorporating things in there in the language that are the references are not too subtle of the, of the thing, but I, I, and I think that, I think Judy Garland is singing beautifully. I think that, that some of it's so powerful and, and uh, Jean's, I use the Nina is the number that I put in my one woman show. And I just think it's so funny that, neurasthenia and all these words that yeah. Cole Porter uses. <laughs> and, and it's so risque. The fact that it got through the censors is, 
astonishing because he's saying, till I make you, till I make you, till I make you mine. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's not too subtle, but it managed to pass. Um, and obviously he was just taunting the, the censors the whole way. But uh, another good question uh, would be, um, did he have any recollections to share with you as we were, as you were doing research? Excuse me. Well, he said it was it was a very hard time with um, because Judy and Vincent Minnelli were not getting along. So it was it made for a very, very did make for a difficult time on set. And there were um, moments where Judy Garland would ask Jean to um, to stage numbers for for her and Vincent standing right there and. And she's saying, no, you know, I want you to do, you can do no wrong. And so Jean is feeling torn because Vincent is the director, but then what's going to work to get Judy Garland to perform and everything. So I think that was, was hard. Sometimes he said that, and he adored Judy Garland. I mean, he really credited, credited her with his career uh, with his uh, teaching him how to perform in front of the camera, with his, he thought she was the brightest woman in Hollywood and the and the most beautiful, um, sexiest. Um, I think, um, I think that what it did, it it kind of, it just made it difficult. It made it awkward, and uh, it, there were times where. Jean and Vincent would be talking and Judy would think that they were whispering behind her back. And it was just a, it just made for a very, very difficult. I I, I think it was more fraught than, um, and, and just to make sure she got to the set and she, she performed, she was just going through a very difficult time. So, but he always wanted to be there to support her. And in fact, that actually leads beautifully into my next question, which was, um, how did Jean and Judy meet? Uh, she came backstage <coughs> when he was on Broadway. And uh, she was, <clears throat> at the time when she first came, she was uh, just a young girl, essentially, and uh, kind of in a very prim I, I, just a prim little outfit. And then when she came back, she, uh, the next time she came, she was, had been in the wizard of Oz and she was obviously the most famous person in the world. Uh, <laughs> and he ended up taking her out on the town in New York. He took her pub crawling and, and they hit it off and, uh, but here, she, here he was with the most valuable asset in the world. You know, he's out on the town, and everybody's panicking because she's not coming back to her hotel. But uh, that so. Then when he came out to Hollywood, ultimately he came. Uh, it was David Oselznik who brought him out, and then he loaned Jean to MGM to make For Me and My Gal. Judy wanted him as, as her co-star in For Me and My Gal. And so uh, Selznick loaned Gene at quite a profit to himself. And then he ultimately sold Gene to MGM for, again for quite a profit to himself. As Gene used to say that they were like old time ball players they, or slaves. I mean, they, they could be bought and traded um, and they had no say in what they, if, if Gene didn't want to do a project, he would have to, uh, he would be uh, put on probation without pay. It was suspension. So he had to do whatever the studio wanted him to do. So, um, but he did have the great fortune to do this first movie with Judy. And, and that was a new level of stardom for him after that came out. And, and they've just became fast friends and really confidants. And, and uh, so when he, he was set to do, he did three pictures with her, um, but was set to do, uh, he did For Me and My Gal, The Pirate, 
and summer stock and was set to do Easter parade. But his friend, uh, Noel Howard came down on his ankle playing volleyball in the backyard and snapped Jean's ankle and took him out of Easter parade. But he always, if, if there was something that Judy needed, then Jean was there because he felt he owed her so much. And he just thought she was the greatest talent and just admired her, um, her voice, her, her knowledge of, he said she was, she had a sixth sense of where the camera was. She knew, she really understood the movement of the camera, but she also knew every Tin Pan Alley song. She knew every verse, every chorus of every song. And they would often do a kind of challenge dance, challenge singing um, to see who knew what lyric, try to fool one another. And they both were very good at that. So, yeah. Actually, could you go ahead and talk about the time that uh, she had to teach him how to kiss on camera? Well, right. It was in a, um, it was in the test actually that she said, she said, you, you can't fake it. He, he was trying to do a stage kiss, which is where you turn your face and turn and, and don't do a real kiss. And she said, you can't do that. And, uh, the camera's right there in your face. So it has to be real. So she basically just planted a very real kiss on him. And he said he was so startled by it that, uh, he figured he had ruined the test, but in fact, uh, in, he thought perhaps that that, that kind of disorientation may have helped in his character that he was supposedly playing in the test, but, but I always thanked her for teaching him how to kiss, you know, (laughs) not like, not like he needed any instructions on that, but he just didn't know how to do it in front of the camera. So she taught him a lot of things. um... She taught him how to sit in a chair. She, he said it was so strange that on stage you would just walk across and sit down. But he said in front of the camera, you had to kind of slide into it and all these little tricks that he just, he just never imagined. And he had to learn the choreographing for the camera was much different. It it was shorter. And the, the way that the camera, the one eyed monster saw the movement was different. So she, she really just taught him a lot of, a lot of things uh, about it that, that he carried, carried with him forever, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just we never seem to think about how if it wasn't for Judy, we would have no American in Paris, no singing in the rain to an extent. You might. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because even after he did for me and my gal, MGM still didn't really know what to do with him. And so he got in these kind of B pictures and it wasn't until he got loaned out to uh to do cover girl that the studio kind of sat up and began to take notice of him. So, um, I, yeah, it's an interesting question. He, he probably would have gotten there somehow because he would have, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to speculate because he, it, it was cover girl that made him really want to experiment with the use of the camera to capture dance. And so, and and otherwise he wasn't even planning to stay in Hollywood. He was supposed to go back to Broadway. So I, it's hard to know what triggered it, but she certainly was an asset um, and someone he felt uh, terribly indebted to. Um, she used to come to the house, not, not when I was there, obviously, but uh, would come by when he had the kind of cabaret in the house and people were singing and she, you know, you'd have Oscar Levant or Leonard Bernstein playing the piano and she would sing and Lena Horne would sing. And so she felt very comfortable coming by in a, in a personal relationship, not only just on the, on the set. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess, uh, getting back into the pirate. Um, so I guess going off with the Nina number in particular, um, it kind of sets off this, dichotomy between Jean, who is this charismatic, all-American, boy-next-door archetype that we see in a lot of his early movies, which 
he may or may not have enjoyed that association. But he plays this character who is... If he was played by any other actor, he'd be the most reprehensible character on Earth. And yet, because it's Gene, we can't help but follow him to the ends of the Earth and see where the story takes him. But I I would say, maybe argue that that's in fact a character that he played because he started with Pal Joey. So you're pay, playing a character that, you know, is not... Um, he, he's here he is you know betting every woman on the stage and yet he was able to make audiences love him and and it was through the dance and the movement and and the singing that he was able to pull the the he, he always said that the wednesday the women in the wednesday matinees he could just feel them just kind of like their fur go up on their back and then and then he would sing and dance and then he'd pull them around and even even in for me and my gal, he's playing a character that is, you know, I think audiences turn against is that he's slams his hand in the trunk so he doesn't have to go to war and things. And so he's, he's very often playing this character that is maybe less than stellar, but manages to pull you in. But I think you're absolutely right is that if it, if it were not Gene, it, it required a certain finesse, a certain ability to pull that off. Um, most, most people could not pull that off. And I think people would, would find them distasteful, but Gene was able to pull it off. It's, it's one of the reasons why I think they've not been able to really do pal Joey again, because you you have to make that character as, as reprehensible as he is. You have to make him compelling to people. You, you have he has to win the audience, and and same with um, the pirate. You know, it's just you have to you have to be drawn in. And Gene is the perfect person. But dance, he's using the movement, the dance to tell the story and to to bring the audience into that character. So you, you see him, Nina's, I mean, here he is, he's doing Nina, you know, he's, he's, he's going from one woman to the next and yet you adore him. You just want him to come to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I will say, um, I don't know if it's okay to get like just a teensy bit personal at this point of the interview. But um, I'd say that the pirate, it didn't exactly contribute to a sort of awakening within me, but it did not stop that progression into appreciating the masculine figure. And Gene Kelly was a definite uh, um, foundation for that. <laughs> yeah, what he's, um, I mean, it's so funny because when I show that, every everybody in the audience, man and men and women are all responding to him because he's, he's seductive. I mean, he's gorgeous, but, and he wiggles his hips in a way that, I mean, but he's, he's, a, he's playing this rascal, but everybody wants to be with him. I mean, that's, what's so funny is that he, everybody wants Mac the black, you know, everybody wants this pirate. And, and, and I think, um, he he was very good at that. He was very good because I think I think part of it is that maybe he's not taking himself so seriously. I think there's a lot there's humor in there. There's wit and charm. So he's he's got that little nod of his head, the little kind of you know, kind of little thing that he does when he calls the people aside and things. That it's it's charming. It's 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 not just kind of aggressive masculinity. It's um, it's just wit and charm, and that's why that's why I love the movie because I don't think you see that as much in the other movies. I think this one really plays that, and I think that's that to me is one of the, that was what Gene Gene would break me up at home with a lot of those things. That kind of funny little face and the little nod and the the, the kind of knowing uh, look and the funny comment and and it wasn't like a stand-up comedian that kind of that kind of laughter and 
it was just just wit and charm and this really and sweet i mean there's a kind of sweetness to it a kind of there's a kind of he's and he's poking fun at himself he's aware of the that it's it's kind of funny. So yeah, <laughs> it's, I, I love it because when he does the cigarette trick, everybody's just gasping in the audience and, and I know it's coming. And then I, I hear everybody go, oh, and then, and then they all do, when he gets up there and dances and he swings around that pole and everybody is drawn in and uh, it, he's, he, he takes us all. He gets us all. Yes. Which is why there, I wish to have like this, uh, some sort of film viewing event where I get some of my friends over and watch the pirate and get their reactions at some point. I don't know when that would ever happen, but it's definitely something that I'd like to experience as you have on multiple occasions. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And I've only, I think I've only introduced the pirate maybe twice in all this time and I hundreds of times for Sing in the Rain, but pirate pirate just doesn't come up it's really um i have always kind of wishing for it but it just doesn't doesn't make it so um yeah we'll have to have a screening someplace <laughs> it'd be nice to have it on a big screen that would because i think when you see it on a big screen you there's so much detail in it so much even the fabrics of the costumes and the colors and things and the and the you know, the big the the street scenes and the dance all the all the Nicholas brothers and the dance and the propulsion of the dance the number that he did with them I mean that's a powerful piece so going on to another musical number that ultimately got cut from the pirate um I could not talk about it without mentioning the infamous voodoo right um and I I guess the pr- the proper way to frame it is that at this point in Judy's career at MGM, she wanted to be seen by both studio executives and the general public as this sophisticated, beautiful young woman. But I, 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 I want to ask, how do you think Voodoo would have contributed to this endeavor? <laughs> well, Jean always said it was um, that Roger Eden's her hit her kind of guide music guide was that both Jean and Roger Edens were trying to make, take Judy into womanhood and the studio kind of wanted her still to be this little girl. And she, she re- wanted to go with Jean and Roger Edens on that. And, but voodoo, he said, he said it wasn't the censors. Ordinarily what would happen is that they might shoot something like that. And the, censors would say nope that that went too far and they would cut it but in fact he said that 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 didn't even make it that far that they it they they realized they all realized it had just gone too far she she just he said she was almost out of kind of in an out-of-body experience and it was such a sexual sensual thing and it was so strange because he said you hear her husband is behind the camera shooting this thing and she's mm-hmm. basically kind of writhing around Jean and uh, completely absorbed in that but he said it, 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 even Jean felt it had gone too far and 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 yet he wished that it hadn't been cut in a weird way that in hindsight it was com- you know comparatively not compared to what we see today not far but but he felt at the time that it, it, but he said it was a very awkward feeling then. So, um, but that, that's, that's lost for, I do have photographs, a few photographs, but it doesn't, they don't really capture what Jean described as being this kind of um, amazing thing that she did, that she just, or that her, you know, her blouse kind of came open and, um, just, just that she was completely in this scene, and so I think we'd all love, love to see it now because it was probably quite extraordinary to watch. But it's gone. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, it just took Mr. Louis B. Mayer to say, oh, no, burn that negative. We cannot expose that to the public lest their eyes be like. <laughs> but it is you know. interesting that Gene, Gene, ordinarily he would not agree with. He didn't like L.B. Mayer and didn't agree with L.B. Mayer and he didn't respect L.B. Mayer, really. But on that one, Gene did feel that it just it went it went too far. So it's an unusual thing. Usually he would have it might have been that he didn't want want it. But but Gene was always looking at the movie, you know, the, so even Gene always said that some of his best numbers were cut out of movies, but because they were usually ballads and then they would slow down the movie at a certain point. So when he sang, I've got a crush on you in American Paris, you know, that got cut out. And, and, and yet it's, a, 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 he said he could have made a living singing that song because it was one that he actually put over quite well, but, but he knew it didn't fit the movie. And, and I think he felt the same when voodoo voodoo was shot. Um, and I guess adding on to that, um, as I was talking about with the more farcical nature of the film's second act, but do you think that, particularly in the reprise of Love of My Life, do you think that it helped solidify the stance that she was wanting to have as a as a mature woman? Or do you think that there are some things that could have complicated that goal? No, I think she, I mean, I think, I think she was moving. I mean, I, th I think the whole movie essentially was kind of moving her into it. You can't really put, put her back in the box of the Wizard of Oz. I mean, she's, she's kind of moved out, I think. So, um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't see one part of the film uh, compromising another or whatever. I, I, I guess I didn't divide the film into the segments that you were, you are seeing much more distinct, you know, farcical things and all that. I guess I just, I took it, more, <laughs> I took it more as, as a whole rather than dividing it up. Yeah. But, but you're, you've. Yeah, forgive me for being analytical. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I mean, good for you. I mean, I just, I, I'm just probably like the, um, I'm, I'm like the, the audience that I just, I just fell in love with it. I just love to watch it. I just, it just kind of, for me, it just kind of washed over me. I just thought, yeah. I was just cracking up. That's part of it is I'm just laughing because Gene is just cracking me up through the whole thing. Oh, yes. And I see it that way too. It's just that, I take it on like multiple levels now and it's just, I find new things to like about it with each watch. Well, I, you know, and it is funny. I mean, I, I'm eager to see it again because I, as I, with Sing in the Rain that I see almost every week, um, I always see something new. And, and now with this new 4k restoration, I, I, I mean, stuff jumps out at you that you just never saw. So I'm sure if I saw the pirate again tomorrow, I would see, and, and I think also with age, I think with as I get older and know more about Gene and everything, uh, you, you see different things at different times. So yeah, I'd I'd like to see it. I'll I'll watch it with your your uh, analytics next time. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to let it just simply wash over me. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know because I, I'm I'm torn with Judy's performance in particular because it's like as you've been doing with Jean and your project, it's like I've been noticing a lot of people harping on her performance because they think that she gives this performance that is elicited by substance within her that is like trying to like bring out this performance that's a little unhinged in some places but i don't see it like i think that she is giving exactly what the project demands and she gives it her all like 110 percent. that's always what she gives but yeah i don't i mean i think jean jean said she she sometimes looked sad or kind of drawn maybe more drawn but he said she he thought she was n never more beautiful and that she sang beautifully in it. He he just he just said she was never more beautiful than in this. He just would look at the screen and 
And so, and, and then he did talk about this, you know, um, mayor wanting to hold her back and Eden's wanting to push her forward. And, uh, Eden's was always in her court, uh, always, always in her court. And, um, so yeah, I, I mean, it was a it was a tough time in her life, but she just per- performed so beautifully. Yeah, and I I don't want to make it sound like I'm harping on that too much. It's just that's just such a, it's like when other people watch it, it's like they have that one track mind reaction to it, and that's typically what they talk about. And I just gosh, that's interesting. I want to move on. No, I just oh gosh, I just I'm just I I'm just knocked out by her in it. I just I'm just my mouth is kind of open just watching her and listening to her. It's I'm, we're really fortunate that we have this movie. I think. I think particularly of the recording she did of love of my life that was cut out like the full three minutes. That's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And I listen to it like at least once a week. It's just so gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, Going back to the pirate ballet, um, did Jean have any thoughts or opinions about the specific costume which he wore? Well, he loved it. I mean, he was always looking for... Uh, his idea was always that you show show the longest line of the body. So you... Um, ideally, he would come out in a ballet leotard. And, but if he came out in a ballet leotard, then he's not going to be Mac the Black. So, so to have short shorts, I mean, that's when Gene wore shorts, he wore short shorts. So even if he's wearing tennis shorts, he, he never wore the long shorts. He couldn't understand why anybody did that. And because he said it just cut the leg in an awkward way. So he wore short shorts and he got a lot of fan mail from that particular costume. So it's, uh, it's great because you see his body, you see his arms, you see his legs, you see the size of his legs, which were like timbers. Um, I mean, even when it, at the end of his life, his legs were like that. And the, the thing he said, it was very difficult to do that that the spear was incredibly heavy and he hadn't really counted on that. And the, so it was very difficult to execute it and to do it and have all of the flames going off and everything. But just the, the, the handling of that was, was you don't really see it in it. You don't see it in his movement, but he said it was very, very difficult. And, um, you know, again, it's kind of, it's kind of hokey, but it's also just kind of extraordinary what he's doing. So, but he said he got a lot of mash notes, um, love notes that, and still, I still people, I, you can just hear people gasping. And if I ever post a picture from the, that, that segment, then everybody's just commenting on how, I mean, he was an incredibly handsome man and, and, and incredibly well-built man um just he was kind of like a perfect proportion man and i know i'm biased but but he really was he really was gorgeous and a beautiful man beautiful face beautiful not just handsome not ruggedly handsome but he was beautiful and i have the mask from mgm and it's a his features are so have a, a again a kind of tenderness a kind of softness to it's not not a not, not, there's some ruggedly handsome stars, and Jean was not that at all. Yes, indeed, Miss Kelly, your husband, God did a good job on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really, I always say they made one and broke the mold. I, I don't, I haven't seen anybody like that coming down the pike. I mean, it, it's a really, I, I don't know. I think, I think too, when we were, making the statue of him for London, his, his face is actually, we did the proportions of the face and everything. And I think it falls within what they consider kind of perfect proportions of the, the distances and things for the, the, the face. And I think that's why he, he, 
I mean, the geometry is there and you see it in the beauty of the face. Um, and actually, a question just popped up in my head to deviate from the pirate just a little bit. Um, I have not heard anything about um, his perspective on gay men, honestly. Well, uh, I think he didn't really have a perspective. They were just, he was, he just worked with, that's what's so kind of strange. You'll hear some accusations. Uh, Arthur Lawrence wrote a note in his book that somehow Gene had some kind of homophobic slur that it was a really cheap shot. Arthur Lawrence says he actually attributes it to Gene, how Gene broke his ankle playing volleyball. He says that Gene lost and then just stomped off. And by stomping his foot, that's how he broke his ankle. And Lawrence said he might have heard a, a homophobic slur. Well, that's a pretty cheap thing to do, I think. And number one, that's not how he broke his ankle. As I said, it was Noel Howard. They both went up for a shot and they both came down and Noel Howard came right on top of Gene's ankle and just snapped it. And can you imagine how you would feel having done that to your best friend um, and taken him out of Easter Parade as a result of it, which he'd already choreographed most of it. Gene was surround. I mean, every almost everybody he's working with is a gay man <laughs> you know i mean you know it's so this notion that he might be homophobic it's kind of like well um roger edens uh, it's conrad salinger i mean all the the arrangers the um obviously dancers choreographers it's so he didn't distinguish he didn't he he didn't he didn't distinguish between a gay man and a straight man he, that was never something he did in his mind it's like you if you hit your marks if you did your job you learned your lines and you hit your marks then you were fine in his book if you didn't then you weren't so mm -hmm. it, it was it was about being a professional and it was about um you know, he didn't, he didn't brook anybody who didn't do pull their weight. That person was out and, and he didn't like um, people getting in on a pass. So people getting in because they were the nephew or the, some relation to somebody that he didn't buy at all. So he never, um, I, I mean, even in my time, we were, we were basically surrounded by, by gay men, straight men. I mean, our house Christmas parties and people coming to the house, it was, they were, they were just the professionals. They were just his friends. They were just people. They weren't. So mm -hmm. um, he didn't. It, it, it's now it's such a distinction and now I think it gets quite complicated because it, it's, you know, Gene was trying to make it okay for a man to be a dancer because people were so ridiculed for a man dancing was considered a bad thing. So Gene did a television special in 1958 called dancing a man's game, trying to show that the movement of a male dancer is the same as the movement of a male baseball player, football, tennis, golf, whatever. So, and he, he did see, unlike somebody like Jack Cole, Gene did choreograph for a man and he choreographed for a woman. He did not think that they were interchangeable. Now, now that now you're hearing much more that the, you can't make that distinction, and um, but but Gene made that distinction because he didn't think that he, he thought that they should be different and that they move differently and they they so. But now, if you say dance like a man, um, that's a very it's a very tricky thing. You can't essentially can't say that anymore. You can't say um, because there, everybody wants a kind of fluidity. Um, so um, 
but there was no, there was certainly no bias and no prejudice and no uh, objection to, and no, um, he was, he had, he was approached quite often by gay men. I mean, he was, um, he, he definitely was a straight man. A lot of people assumed he was a gay man because he was a dancer. So a lot of people ask me, they'll say he was, he was gay. Right. And I'm like, no, he wasn't. Gay. <laughs> you know, it's, so it's a very strange thing that people just assume you're a dancer, you're, you're a man, male dancer, you're a gay man. And I think that was very hard for him because um, it was both both Gene and Frank had had um, people who sought him and 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 really kind of obsessed with him. Frank had somebody like that, and and so yeah, I don't. But to to accuse him of of homophobia i mean it's like every most everybody he's working with that's what i just think i think leonard bernstein every i mean it's just a i mean yeah vincent minnelli sort of yeah we don't it's hard to know about vincent and but um all of liza minnelli's husbands certainly and um so yeah he just if you if you were a professional you did your work he had great respect for you. If you did your work well, he then, then, and showed up on time, <laughs> you didn't show up late. You didn't muck things up. Then you were all right in his book. Mm-hmm. Um, which leads to a great segue onto the be a clown number, which he performs with uh, Fayard and Harold Nicholas. Um, I have heard that there was quite a struggle to get them included in that number. No, there wasn't a struggle to get them included. It was it was actually um, Gene wanted to do it because he knew that they were the only two who could do the 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 number is made up. Gene choreographed it. It's made up of a number of what's what are called and you probably know this what are called flash steps. So ordinarily you would take one of those and that would be the end to your number. So but Gene took multiples of them put and put them link them all so it's it's just flash step after flash step it's things that it's things that you end in with a big pizzazz but he he made it but he knew the only two people who could do it were the nicholas brothers and that it this was another case where lb mayor he didn't say no to it he just said it will be cut out of the picture in uh, numerous places in the South. And Gene didn't quite believe that at, uh, at the time. Um, but so uh, L.B. Mayer wasn't blocking it being shot. He just warned, cautioned that, that if you shoot it, it's going to be cut out of the picture. And sure enough, it was cut out in uh, most of the Southern states. And so... Um, but it, to the studio's credit, they, they went along with it. So it's the, it was the movie houses that cut it out and it, it isn't true. You'll, uh, Fayard and Harold are lovely guys and, but they, they told a story about rehearsal and things and that it's not, it's not true, but, um, it, it's funny how so many of the performers kind of conjure stories that make them a little more that kind of aggrandizing, I guess, in their minds. But the funny thing to me is that the, the truth is so interesting. (laughs) The way things actually transpired, I don't see why you need to embellish them or feel the need to embellish them because it's miraculous that these things happen. And when you look at that number, I mean, you just can't even believe that they're doing what they're doing. I mean, it's the action on the body of, of, you know, doing the thing that going across the stage and the push up, that was kind of a common trick that Gene did. He would, he was on the Ed Sullivan show and that's what he did. He bounced off the stage like that. So that was kind of one of his things. He was incredibly strong. He, he was, terribly strong um 
and um, but when you watch it, it, it's just it's pretty astonishing that they that they were all able to do it and and to do the, that that kind of athleticism um, in such intensity. So. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they decide to let Judy have a go at it at the end. She insisted on it. She yeah. um, she saw their, them. She saw that they got to do it, and then she said, "I want to do that, and I want to end it with that." So then they reprised it, and um, so, and that number actually was written by Cole Porter overnight. That was Gene wanted a kind of wanted a clown number he he went to Cole Porter and he said um I'd like it to be a a kind of a clown number and so he did that and Gene went to his house he said that was the first time he went for lunch and he said that was the first time he'd ever had anyone uh, a butler pour wine for him uh to taste um that he, that he ever saw somebody pouring wine for someone to taste with with uh, Cole Porter tasting the wine before lunch and uh, but but then Porter said come back and the, the next day he called the next day and he had written the whole thing and so um, it, it's a it's a great piece and I think when they reprise it it's great fun too you can see it I just bought some four by five negatives of, of the shooting of that and, and the camaraderie between Gene and Judy. And that is really fun. And they're, and they're just playful. They're playful. It's the kind of kinship that I'm sure that we all aspire to have at some point in our own lives with whoever comes around. Yeah. I think Gene had a word. Um, most of his friends were men, but Judy was an exception and, um, it was a kind of pal ship, a kind of pals, you know, that these, um, and obviously he would turn up if she was in trouble, he sh- would show up. Um, there was one time she was playing the palace and, and, uh, he got word that she, that she wanted him to, to go there to see it. And so he, he went and so, yeah, just too, too, too young, too young to, these are, that's one of the reasons why Gene said he never wanted a biopic because we watched one of, of Judy and, and he would see these biopics of his friends, people that he knew. And, and he felt like, they were just destroyed that they were really minimized in these stories and, and that she was just, uh, I always described them as comets that she just sort of flew through the sky once you, you don't get that again. That's you get one Gene Kelly, you get one, get one Frank Sinatra, you get one Judy Garland. People can imitate it, but they can't get that essence of those people no and that's what we have left to reflect on in the 21st century (laughs) yeah gene kept waiting for the next guy kept wanting the next guy to come along but it's very hard to find triple threats quadruple quintuple sestuple septuple octuple threats um even Gene casting Hello Dolly said it was very difficult to find people who could sing, dance, and act. Um, he had to go kind of far and wide to to cast people for that. So, I mean, I think now you see people that are really good singers. They're really good dancers. They're really good. They might be great actors. But to, to be able to do all three and have that, evanescent that quality that you can't even you know you can't bottle you can't it's not either you have it or you don't either you either you have that that extra thing or you don't i don't think you can learn that in any actor studio or anything no um and actually if i may share another personal tidbit um I was involved in a community theater production of Singing in the Rain this last summer. Wow. And 
Yes, and uh, it wasn't really worth all the bells and whistles, but uh, we it was still a very fun experience with like a few more months of rehearsal than most people would have wanted, but uh, it was still <laughs> worthwhile. And um, it was the first time that I'd actually practiced uh, tap dancing because I'd never done that before. And as soon as we were rehearsing, I think the first number we did was uh, Good Morning. Wow. And once I put those on... It was just the most comfortable thing to me because I not only have I observed people like Gene doing steps in for in these movies for all these years, but just figuring out how to make it work for myself because like I I'm not a loud tapper, um, but it's something that I feel like I it, if I was less confident in myself, it would take longer to develop within me, but um, I'd say that until I get that like further refined now that that production's gone off, uh, I'll stick to just acting and singing for the time. being. <laughs> it's yeah. You're ahead of me. I never, I didn't try tap dancing. I don't, I don't have any skill in that. Um, I obviously, I went off to ballet class, but never tap dancing. And I think to get it, you've got a lot of people who are, they're, there's a lot of tap dancing now. I mean, it's become, it's kind of coming more to the fore than, than I'd say at, at points in the past. I think when you watch Gene tap dancing, there's just such an effortlessness of, and again, such engagement with the audience. I mean, he's, he's moving his body and is, it's a, like Moses supposes is so, fluid. I mean, he just looks like it's just like he's, it's such an easy movement and, and he's smiling and he's looking. Now I think there are a lot of tap dancers that blatantly refuse to even look at the audience. You know, they, they, they don't, they almost sneer at the audience. And I, I, I think I find that that doesn't do a thing for me. That doesn't do anything for me. I think I mean, clearly, I mean, again, I'm biased, but Gene, Gene's style of tap dancing, I think, is beautiful. And, and it came, a lot of it came from Bill Robinson, from Bojangles, as he was seeing him as a child, that, that he said the clarity and precision of his taps, that he picked up on that. And so, and the, obviously going up and down the stairs and things, so. Um, he was pulling from lots of different dancers. Gene was like a big sponge. He just absorbed whatever he could from anyone, uh, different styles. And that's one of the things that's interesting about the pirate is you don't see the tap dancing because of the turn. It's the turn of the century. Uh, and it's also the, the Caribbean as they say it. Um, and, uh, that, so you see a West Indies style of dance, you see gymnastics, you see, um, you see every other format, but not, not tap because tap, he always said was what you throw in. If you want somebody, if you want to say American, uh, then taps suggest that they just scream American. So, um, but you see, um, see and that was one of the things he always encouraged young people. He would say, study all forms of dance so that you can play whatever character you need to play. So Spanish dance, if it's anchors away and um, you do La Cumpercita and uh, this, the West Indies style and things. So tap, obviously, f for singing in the rain, um, ballet for American Paris. So he, he really honed every, every style. Uh, and most, most young people don't, they'll, they'll stick with one or they may do a little jazz and ballet, but um, yeah, it's a different world now. You'll have to work on your ballet next. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, well, I'll keep you informed when that comes around. Yeah. You let me know about that. <laughs> Well, um, I guess that's all the questions that I had prepared for you, but um, do you have any final thoughts to share about the pirate? Well, I was looking, I, um, 
I was noticing I, I when I did go to USC, uh, I jotted down everything. I, I rec- because you have two different records, you have two different production notes, sets of notes that are kept by two separate people, and it's it's a it's a minute by minute account of what transpires, and I think people are really surprised by that because. Uh, but it was a business, so they had to keep track of every minute. Every minute is a dollar, you know, it means money. And uh, one of them that was so um, uh, interesting to me was that in one of the AD reports, the Daily Progress report from July 10th, 1947, from 334 to 359, they had to wait for Mr. Kelly because he was baking his leg under a lamp. Um, so he'd obviously injured. I mean, most of the time he was hurt, um, either dancing with a sprained ankle, torn ligaments, everything. So that was one. And then also uh, in the, the one of the be a clowns, let's see, it was, People, people will say, oh, he did that in one take or something. It's never in one take. It's, it's long takes. That's the distinction is that you have long takes. And if he's cutting, he's usually cutting on a turn. So you don't get this chopped up body part thing. And he's usually shooting head on and full figure. And um, the, so for example, uh, one, um, in the be a clown number uh, it was 61 takes for one segment 64 takes for another segment um so you're and i i think it was over when it closed um it was actually 226,669 dollars over budget but that was the and that's what everybody notes about it, as opposed to how great it is that they they just note that it went over. But that was um, that was the time. Um, and summer stock had a similar problem. So when if you don't have stars that can get to the set um, physically and emotionally, then it can tend to run over. So, but I think it's great, and I think we should. Um, Oh, here's one too. The AD log from July 10th, 1947 from 429 to 434 repair torn trousers. These are these, these, are these really, you know, it's like, and, and then also you've got Gene, um, Gene is shooting numbers for living in a big way while he is rehearsing for the pirate, but then he is also looping for, uh, for three musketeers while he's rehearsing slaughter on 10th Avenue. So, I mean, these are these things he's still finishing American Paris while he's doing sing in the rain. So you imagine Mm -hmm. he's going from one set to the next, to the next and doing all these different things. So, um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted that I have found a, a pal who loves, loves the pirate as much as I do, because I really, I think it's I think it's an extraordinary film and I I I hope I I hope we can find find a theater where where you can run it and I'll come and introduce it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to travel cross country or something but we'll, well see. <laughs> I don't mind I I'm I'm do you know I'm doing my my symphonic show opens in Seattle in March and and then I'm going to try to get it out and across the country and get my one woman show back out. And now that COVID is somewhat in check, um, at least some theaters are opening and things. So I think anything's possible. I think you just make it happen. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess this concludes the chapter on Disney Real to Real. Patricia, words cannot express my gratitude and you guesting on this episode. It has been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you. And thank you for reaching out. I, I do appreciate it. I, and let's do it again. Let's find another one and we can talk about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to, I mean, as you know, this is, this is my passion. So I'm always happy to, to 
hook up and, and get the word out to more people. And, because maybe a few more people will watch the pirate that haven't seen it, and that would be great. And then maybe they'll watch more. It kind of leads. I often I find that people will watch one, and then they want to watch more. And and if and then you can see all of Jean and Judy together, and I think that's that's really important. So so thank you and. Call me when you have something else. Oh, you know, I would love to. Um, tell everybody is, to go, wanna... tell everybody to follow me on uh, Instagram is Gene Kelly Legacy and Facebook is Gene Kelly The Legacy. And I do answer, I do respond if people write. So tell them to send messages and things. And then I'll also post, if they, they can go to genekelly.com and sign up for notices and I'll be soon be bringing that website alive and then I'll have notices when the shows are appearing around the world. So, so that's all. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but thank you. No, no. I was literally just about to ask you if you wanted to plug anything. So thank yeah, you. <laughs> just, just follow me, follow, because I do tell the stories and I do try to post interesting little bits every every day or as as often as I can. So, uh, and I love the comments and the interaction with people. People have been very generous with communicating with me and I I do read everything and I do try to respond. I I read every comment and I do post everything myself. So I'm always happy to, to be in touch with people. So, so yes, please reach out. All right, you heard the lady. So <laughs> thank you and I'll I'll until next time. All right, until next time. Have a magical day everybody. Bye. That will share the same fate and from then on sweet angel I shall worship you my life